I'm grateful for the faithful stewardship of the indigenous communities of this land known as Turtle Island. I'm grateful for the territories that make up Treaty 6 and invite you now to name your territory where you reside in the chat box. I commit myself to listen, learn and work towards justice and reconciliation. Welcome friends to this service of prayer and reflection hosted by the Black Clergy Network of the United Church of Canada. We come this evening acknowledging the evils of racism and our struggles against it. It is a struggle which has been for over four centuries long. We come to affirm the inherent dignity of Black people as we acknowledge that we are made in the image and likeness of God. We come with resolve that racism must end and it is possible to do so. We come declaring that black lives matter. We come with the hope and faith of our ancestors and with the poet James Weldon Johnson, we, are, we come celebrating that hope. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies, let it resound loud as the rolling seas. Sing a song full of the faith that the past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. We are tonight shining the light of our faith onto the illness of racism. We come to pray, knowing that prayer leads to action. We come to worship, knowing that our faith is renewed in worship. And when our worship is over, we will continue to serve God through actions to end racism. Throughout this worship, seven candles will be lit. Please note that a candle cannot be lit by thoughts or words alone. If a candle is to be lit, we have to act to do so. These candles are symbolic of the light of God, and yet they are also reminders that we have work to do. May we all be inspired tonight to act against racism. And by acting against racism, you and I will be lighting our respective candles. And when all our candles are put together, then indeed racism can be defeated. We light a candle in memory of the ancestors, and especially our ancestors who endured the cruelty of enslavement in North and South America and in the Caribbean.
Let us pray. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat at the world when we remembered Zion. O oh God, that was a story of the Jewish people long time ago. O oh God, this too is our story today, we the people of African descent. Be with us as we lament over 400 years of suffering. Be with us as we connect with the spirit of our ancestors who died in the continent of Africa while being hunted for their black bodies. Be with us as we connect with all the spirit of the millions of our people who were drowned in the Atlantic Ocean in chains. Be with us as we honor our ancestors who endured in the plantations from Brazil to the Caribbean, in white households in Europe and here in Canada, to hand over life to many of us here today. Be with us as we honor the blood of all our people that was shed in the continent of Africa by the gun of the white colonizers for years. Be with us as we refuse to let the blood of George Floyd, Brina Taylor, and Ahmaud Aubrey, among others, to dry up in vain. Let your life and giving spirit counter the power of the suffocating racist knee. Be with us here today as we comfort one another in our range, in our lamentations, and in our hoping. It is in you, O oh God, that today we lay our ability to breathe. Amen.
Flying Boy by Cassandra Powell. They said the air wasn't made for me, that my feet weren't meant for riding the wind, leaping over violet ripples in the sky, frolicking in marshmallow clouds, the mango sun bundling my dark naked body in its light, freedom pinching at my sides. They said I had no right to dream of heaven, so I directed my gaze towards a place more befitting for a brown boy, the ground. Six feet of spit drenched dirt. No colorful arcs etched in the sky after the rain. Because mama said my path would be rocky. She says it's just the way of our journey. The solemn black exodus from the streets to the grave. Grandmama said to stop flapping my arms, to keep my feet planted on gravel, to always part my lips into a smile, wide as the Red Sea, so as not to frighten nice old white folks, or they might crush my budding dreams like vermin under their good white feet. And Daddy said to watch my mouth in front of the evil ones, to hide my invisible wings, to wash some of the pride from my face and keep my tongue clenched between my teeth. And I found the only way to survive was to learn to walk with my eyes pointed away from the sun, my mouth stapled too tight to inhale the pureness of air and my black feet grabbing onto the earth for life. Because the smart folks on TV said brown boys like me exist in a cruel duality where living is a curse and a blessing, a wicked, sweet gift. For they say the air wasn't made for me, that my feet weren't made for riding the wind. And the bullet might be my only shuttle to heaven. We light a candle to remember all who have suffered because of racism. Let us pray. We feel abandoned by you, O oh God. In this international decade for people of African descent, we feel unable to ascend because of the knee on our neck. Where have you been for these past hundreds of years of enslavement, oppression of your people? Where are you now, Lord, as a tenacious and evolving force of oppression continues to be the knee on our neck? And is it true, O oh God, that we are being punished for the misdeeds of our ancestors? Is it true that we need unrelenting hardship to learn to love you? We cry out in the words of our ancestor Jesus and many other ancestors besides and place before your cries of lament in the ancient words they passed on. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. What do you want, God? We want this to end. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Your silence is deafening. Are you asleep, God, or on vacation? Why do we still feel these ancient words of lament? 
I am one who has seen affliction under God's wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without light. Against me alone, he turns his hand again and again all day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away and broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me sit in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has put heavy chains on me. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with hewn stones. He has made my paths crooked. He's a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He led me off my way and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a mark for his arrow. He shot into my vitals the arrows of his quiver. I have become the laughing stock of all my people, the object of their taunt songs all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say gone is my glory and all that I had hoped for from the Lord. The thought of my affliction and my homelessness is wormwood and gall. My soul continually thinks of it and is bowed down within me. For you, O oh God, a thousand ages are only a night. But for us, one night with the weight of racism on our neck feels like a thousand ages. How long, O oh Lord? How long must we wait for your help? How long before we know that our hope is not in vain? How long before justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream? How long before we experience the peace that passes all understanding? Does the Spirit pray for us when all we can offer is sighs and groans? Yes, the Spirit prays for us. And through the daily telling of our stories, God empowers our sisters and brothers because God is the weaver of the tapestry of our lives. My name is Samuel Bover Dansoho, and my story begins almost seven decades ago in Saint Louis, a city along the river Senegal in West Africa. Well, I spent the first 18 years of my life in Senegal before leaving to study theology in Strasbourg, France. I returned after my studies to my country and was ordained in the Protestant Church of Senegal in 1982. I got married to Selma Shipenda in 1987. We left Senegal in 1991 and spent 20 years in the States, in the United States of America. The 10 first in Chicago, Illinois, 
and the last 10 in Salisbury, North Carolina. He left the USA to come to Canada and entered Canada on October 16, 2012. I then served as a minister in Quebec at St. Pierre and Penge before taking my current position here in Sherbrooke on the 1st of November, 2014. Racism. Racism is a multifaceted monster. A monster who takes different forms and infests almost every aspect of our lives. We just tend sometimes to ignore it or be desensitized as a way of surviving because it hurts so bad and it wounds so profoundly. That knee, that knee on George Floyd and the worldwide outpouring of protest despite of COVID-19 are they not just a reminder and a wake up call? Well, we cannot let down the fight. And that fight will take a lifetime struggle. Let us not be fooled. But we are a people of hope. And my hope is for anti-racism to become a second nature in each and all of us to become a way of life, just as witnessing the gospel is supposed to be a way of life, just as worshiping God is supposed to be a way of life. With all our love, all our strength, all our might, all our mind, and all our spirit, everything. Well, in fact, my story did not start only at my birth. Take, for example, my name. You see, following the tradition of my family, and as I was their firstborn male child, my parents named me after my father's father. According to missionary files, my grandfather Samuel was 11 years old when he was rescued from a caravan of enslaved people just about to be sent away through the Sahara Desert somewhere in North Africa. He was nicknamed Samuel Vauvert after the village of Vauvert in the then Huguenot part of France. That village adopted him as its pupil. And from there on, he was nicknamed Samuel Vauvert. He was called by his first name and everything was forgotten about his full name, Moussa Samuel Vauvert Danseho. I'm almost done. The story of Samuel Vauvert will and need to be told with all the struggle, the faith, the humiliation, the resilience, and the strength, the hopes that go with it but it will be for another day. La luta continua. We are going to light a candle to acknowledge the endurance of people of African descent in standing against racism. Stony 
the road we trod. Bitter the chastening road felt in the days when hope unborn has died. The scripture reading from Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6 and 13 to 18 is taken from the New Revised Standard Version. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down, and you acquaint with all my ways. Even before a word on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and lay your hands upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret intricately woven in the depth of the earth. My eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How wealthy to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Fearfully and wonderfully made. These words read by Reverend Swan just now, sung by the psalmist, thousands of years ago. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Our words we must allow to soak into our being so we can sing them to broken people in a broken world. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, beautiful through and through. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I say to you, anyone or anything that says otherwise is wrong. Any feeling, any belief, any system that says otherwise to any person, to any part of creation is wrong. Unfortunately, alongside this beautiful truth of God's creation is an ugly truth of human brokenness. Now, today, I will focus on anti-Black racism, but I could just as well be talking about any number of other forms of oppression against people who are fearfully and wonderfully made. All forms of racism, sexism, ableism, ageism, heterosexism, cisgenderism, classism, settlerism, and the list goes on. Like those other forms of oppression, anti-Black racism is based on a system that in many ways, direct and indirect, tells lies. In this case, lies to and about 
peoples of African descent by suggesting that we are somehow less than fearfully and wonderfully made. A system that tells a black person in the classroom or in the boardroom or in the cafe or in the street or wherever that you have to be kinder to prove that you are not mean. You have to be speak softer to prove that you are not a threat. You have to move slower to prove that you are not attacking. You have to dress nicer to prove that you are not disrespect, disrespectable. You, you have to talk smoother to prove that you are not unknowledgeable. You have to be better to prove that you are not unworthy. And then none of that is enough. It's a lot of pressure. It's the pressure of a lie, a deadly lie. But I've noticed something, not only the people who are the targets of racial oppression are harmed by the lie, all of us are. I have seen white people, as a person of color myself and as an anti-racism educator, I have seen white people start to find a glimmer of truth about the extent of racial injustice, only to then fall into a guilt that seems to be so paralyzing. It is as if learning about the unfair advantage that they have, it's like a message telling them that somehow they would have to be less than fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, this part of the lie is particularly insidious because it will make you resist believing what you are being told about racism. So to my white brothers and sisters, to my white siblings in humanity, I say, when you want to turn away from the notion that you might be complicit in racism, do not turn away. Acknowledging your place in a racist society will not make you a bad person. Racism is not about you any more than it is about us. Racism, like any form of systemic oppression, is not about who we are or who we are created to be. It is about the ways society assigns power and favor based on distinctions created by society, not distinctions created by God. God's truth, which is the beautiful truth, is that all of us are beautiful. Each of us is beautiful. Each of us is fearfully and wonderfully made. In our core, we are imprinted with that knowledge. Friends, we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. Have I said that enough? Well, I'm going to say it more because this is the truth that can bring us to wholeness. This is the beautiful truth that can help us face the ugly truth about racism. This, the very existence of racism is an ugly truth made from human brokenness, not from God's perfection. But it is a truth that spreads a lie and facing it is uncomfortable to say the least. Whether you are black or white or indigenous or Asian or brown or whatever color you identify with or are identified with. There is no way for any of us to face the truth about racism authentically and not feel uncomfortable. There is a saying, if you aren't angry, you haven't been paying attention. If you are not angry, you have not been paying attention. So be pre prepared to feel angry and to feel sad and to feel hurt. Know that it is okay for you who are fearfully and wonderfully made to feel angry and sad and hurt over wrongs that have been done to you and your family and over wrongs that you and your family have done to others. That means that you're paying attention. It is okay to feel angry and sad and hurt about wrongs, whether you knew it or not, whether you intended or not, that you participated in. That means that you are paying attention. It is okay to feel angry and sad and hurt about benefits that others have gained at your expense and about benefits that you have gained at the cost of another. 
that means that you have been paying attention. Take that anger and sadness and pain, infuse it with the love you have been given and use it to propel you toward real and lasting healing. But notice, notice when you have crossed the line from truth to lie and then take a step back. It is okay to feel angry and sad and hurt about those things, but when they lead you to feel bad about who you are, then it is, that is when you have crossed the line from an ugly truth to an uglier lie. The brokenness created by racism is true, but it's a temporary truth. And we are here this evening to lament that truth and to undo that truth. The beauty created by God in each and every one of us and in creation is true for all time. And we are here this evening to celebrate that truth. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. This truth resonates and is one, is the one truth that triumphs in the end. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. When you get a chance, look in a mirror and say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And then look at a brother or a sister, a sibling in humanity and say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. This is the truth that can give us all the power to undo injustice, to challenge oppression, to restore our society and ourselves to a full reflection of God's original gift. This is the truth that can give us the wisdom and the compassion and the courage to address the very real brokenness that we hear about in the news and that we face every day. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, loved by a God who knows you completely, loved by a God who knows your thoughts, who knows your words before they are on your tongue and still loves you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, pursued by a God who's, from whose love you can never escape. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, redeemed from your brokenness by a Christ who sees you and calls you even before you know him or her or them. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Know that, live that, and God's spirit will empower you to bring the good news of God's love for all of God's creation. God said it, the psalmist sang it, Christ affirmed it, you and I, each one of us is fearfully and wonderfully made. Thanks be to God. Uh, there is no question that racism is a blight on humanity and an indictment on its perpetrators, enablers, encouragers, cheerleaders, and bystanders. The last few weeks have been particularly painful, rehashing feelings of anger, bitterness, and even hatred towards the aforementioned groups of people irrespective of race. Racism has affected me in such a way that I do not celebrate Black History Month as a way of not prolonging or deepening feelings of anger, bitterness, and hatred towards white people. For me, Black History Month is too painful. And then the thought that Black history being relegated to a month of observance only further serves as a smack in the face of this great race. I have had so many experiences of racism towards me, my wife and my children, that I have lost count of the experiences and sometimes shove them off into that part of the brain or innocuously and inadvertently have them hidden away by my brain that protects us humans from the horridness of traumatic life events. Both my kids have seen parents of white kids drag their kids away from and scolding them for interacting with my kids. 
and this before my very eyes and those of, of my wife. My son has been targeted by his kindergarten teacher for behavioral modification because the teacher thought he was too close to a white kid, who, by the way, was the only student to make my son feel welcome when he started kindergarten. And being the loyalist that he is, my son naturally gravitated towards her. It pained my heart when my son, five years old, came home from school and told me that his teacher does not want him to play with his best friend and that he is scared of her to the point where she patrols the school grounds during recess to ensure she keeps them apart. It pained my heart when at the end of the first year, the school sent home a video compilation of candid photographs. Each student had multiple candid shots. It pained my heart when as we watched, my son kept asking, where is my picture? We watched on and waited and waited and waited, hoping each time that the next one would be his. The last photo in the video compilation was his, and it was the only candid shot of my son in the entire compilation. My wife and I decided never to watch that video again and never to show it to her son again. We were delighted when her son was removed from that teacher's class. My wife has had clients ref openly refuse to see her at her former workplace, stating, that, stating to the manager that they are uncomfortable. Thank God, my wife has since left that job. In 2001, when I was living in Hamilton, I was at a church event when a white man came up to me and asked me with a wry smile if I came over to Canada on a boat. In 2017, when one of my staff was asked by the property chair to put a window air conditioning unit in my office, the staff member responded very loudly that I'm from Jamaica, so I'm used to the heat and can deal with it. These are just a few racist encounters I've had to live through. Statements, quotations, and hashtags regarding anti-black racism and the execution of black men and women are important messaging, but cannot and should not be the end game. Eradicating anti-black racism will require the execution of concrete, specific and measurable actions that lead to lasting systemic and structural change. Expressions of grief, horror, and solidarity, listening sessions, and talking about the problem, resource lists, and even calls to action are not action. Future generations will judge us neither by the books we read nor the number of focus groups, town halls, or webinars we, we held, but by our collective, sustained, and nonviolent efforts and actions to dismantle existing structures and systems and policies of black oppression, repression, and suppression in service of promoting equality for black people. A quote from Enrique Neblet. We light a candle to remember we are called to love. We have come over a way that with tears has watered, has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered, out from the gloomy past, till now we stand at last, where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. Blooming Bones by Karen Georgia A. Thompson. The hand of the Lord came upon me and he brought me out of, 
up by the spirit of the Lord and set me down on the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley and there were, they were very dry. He said to me, mortal, can these bones live? Valley of dry bones, absent of life, can these dry bones live? Evidence of wanting, a stockpile of life gone, piled high to the sky, devoid of breath, no purpose, none collecting, none commenting, all watching these dry bones, none to prophesy. Standing in the valley, staring at these bones, their confounded presence haunting the living, their bitter dryness glistening in the sun, filtering through leaves, their stark whiteness contrasting grass, green of trees, fertile earth, brown bodies, no longer flesh and breath. Can these dry bones live? Who will prophesy? What died leaving this valley of bones? The breath of our humanity? Our will to live love? Disparaging skin as sin, decrying gender as inferior? Who died leaving this valley of bones? Is this pile of whiteness African ancestors long past? Our black and brown children prematurely taken, mistaken as a threat? Their white bones in the sun, mocking the glorification of whiteness, undistinguishable from the bones of bitter oppressors who will prophesy. Who will prophesy to these bones? Standing in the valley, staring at these bones, listening to the breath of a past forgotten, wishing for the wisdom of ancestors, crying, bones weeping, dryness, tears unseen, as the clouds roll over the sky opens. Speaking into this valley, waters rolling down, bringing a new thing, blowing from the four winds, teardrops, raindrops waters of hope, splashing dreams and visions, the mystery of dust turned mud, pollen from trees, these bones live. From them emerge petals, blooming bones. In the valley, a generation watching hope emerge, standing in the valley, staring at these bones, prophesying truth. I offer words that were presented by Lloyd Nairota. And we pray. Eternal Father, you created us in your own image and likeness but sin has damaged the minds of humanity. And throughout the world, there is much injustice and much carelessness of the rights of other people and personal responsibility. When you're excluded from the hearts and consciousness of people, the inevitable result is that people suffer. And Lord, there's much injustice and corruption taking place in our world today not only in the lives of individuals, but also in the corridors of power and the council rooms of many nations. Help us to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless and plead the widow's cause. Isaiah 1 verse 17. Remind us of what is good and what you require of us but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God, Micah 6, 8. Keep us 
Father, from trying to take matters into our own hands for vengeance is yours, and you will repay. But Lord, in your grace and mercy, we pray that you would give justice and peace to all those that have been cruelly and unfairly treated by their fellow human beings. And may injustice and carelessness that they have had to endure as knees are pressed on their necks. Loving Lord, thank you for the wonderful example of your life, which was lived in spirit and truth, a life that demonstrated love as well as justice, a life that cared for all humanity, especially those who were weak or hurting or marginalized or those who were sinking into a pit of despair or poverty. Be close to all who are feeling the bitter winds of depression, the winds of scarcity in their lives, and uphold them with the warming breath of your love and grace. Keep us, we pray, from making wrong judgments about those that are suffering affliction or who have been overtaken by the challenges of poverty. Give us a wider perspective on life and a heart of compassion and kindness, especially on those that feel alone, unloved, or uncared for. May we become your eyes and ears, and may your heart of love and grace flow through us to those who are in need. Look down in pity on all who are suffering loss, poverty, or unjust discrimination at this time. And we pray that in your best time, your justice will prevail in each of their lives. Jesus, you were the one that came to seek and to save that which was lost. And there are many lost and hurting people in our world today that are having to comply with unjust measurement measures and rogue governors whose decisions often lead to intense misery and pain. Be gracious to all who have been unjustly treated by unfair measures. Look down on them in pity and mercy. Provide for all their needs according to your riches in mercy. Turn the hearts of those leaders who have set aside godly principles and who in their pride have followed a path of selfishness and greed, turn them back to you. In your grace, loving one, I ask that you would intervene and show mercy on those that are being harmed and abused by their policies. Keep us from trying to address the ills of this world from a human perspective. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power, against the spiritual rulers of this dark world. But thanks be to God, who has given us the victory over them all through our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that you are going to right all wrongs and wipe away all tears from our eyes. And so we place all the injustice of today's world before you, asking that in your time and in your way, you would right all the wrongs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we shine this, the light of this candle as we recommit ourselves to strive and seek for justice. Our next reading is from Revelations 7, 9 to 10. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice saying, 
Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God. Hijack whatever I may say that your spirit may make of it what you will for each of us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, I like words. I've always liked words. I'm a talker. You could say I make my living as a preacher with my mouth and the use of words. When I was a young boy living in Barbados, I remember my mother telling me that I came out of the womb talking. She would tease me and say, Tony, she called me Tony. Aren't you afraid you're going to run out of words? And I would answer, no, mommy, there are just too many words. I love using words and exploring the meaning of words. Words are powerful. Are they not the externalized artifacts of imagined and thought up images and ideas? The origins and evolution and meaning of words are fascinating to me. So I bring this curiosity and quest for meaning to some key words in our text from Revelation chapter seven. Now here's a confession. I broke a promise I made to my New Testament professor, Dr. Lloyd Gaston. He made me promise to read a verse uh, of the Bible in Greek every single day. Well, Sorry, Professor Gaston, I, I have failed. But I remember and use enough of my biblical Greek to benefit from the great lexical tools that are available. Meta tauta aidon kai idu oklos polis. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude. That's what the text says. These words speak theologically and perceptively into our present moment. The word aidon in Greek means to discern clearly, to experience. It is, in essence, intentional focused engagement, that with which one is connecting. It is about looking with your whole being and soul and all of your attentiveness. It's about really, really seeing what one is looking at. There's a huge difference between the mechanics of how the cornea refracts the rays of light that pass through the round hole of the pupil with the iris regulating the amount of light admitted and seeing seeing with discernment and with awe and with respect and with reverence. The next phrase in our text, and behold, a great multitude is also significant. The Greek word aidu is translated behold, and it's used in its imperative. And that's important because in our contemporary parlance, it would be something like, you've got to see this. You don't want to miss this. So what is it that we're not supposed to miss? What is it that we are to discern clearly, to experience and just not miss? It is nothing other than the diverse, multitudinous, varyingly constituted people of the whole world. The Greek words are pantos ethnos, meaning essentially every kind of human there is, including foreign ones. Now, the theological meaning of the implied foreign ones is specifically to proclaim that no peoples, no tribe, no nation, no linguistic group is more important than another. These words and the meaning of them are incredible. I mean, can't you feel the excitement of the text from every nation and tribe and people and language standing before the throne of the Lamb? Every single expression of humanity standing equally before the throne, the lamb, no distinction of hierarchy, no distinction of privilege, no distinction of status, no ground is yielded to domination, the enslavement of one group over another, the preferential treatment of one over another. This text and God will have none of it. It is about the fulsome acknowledgement, acknowledgement of the sacredness and dignity of every people. But here's the big but. As humans, we subscribe to sin and sinfulness. Now, I know those are not words that many like to use in the United Church. But for me, sin is not primarily about being bad. It is primarily about being away, being away from the intentions and the commands and the desire and the will of God. An example of this sinfulness, this awayness from God is the invention of the myth, the myth of race. We assume, so many people assume that the notion of race has always existed. But that is not true. It was invented by Western European philosophers. The ancient Greeks had no term, no word for race. In 1684, Francois Benoit published the first classification of humans into distinct races. And this was followed in 1735 publication by Carolus Linnaeus, which further classified people according to differences. The renowned German philosopher that many people revere, Immanuel Kant, 
stated, humanity is at its greatest perfection in the race of the whites. The yellow Indians do have a meager talent. The Negroes are far below at the lowest point. David Hume wrote, I am apt to suspect that Negroes, and in general, all species of men to be naturally inferior to the whites. You see, race is socially constructed I category of identity based on ideology that situates human beings in a hierarchy of social value. Race as a biological fact does not exist, but racism does. We know that the 10 year human genome project studied 3.3 billion base pairs of human DNA and found there's absolutely no, absolutely no basis for this notion of racism. Tragically, this arbitrary hierarchical classification of humanity has bequeathed a legacy that continues to this day, infecting not only attitudes and behaviors, but also the very structures and policies and systems of our society. Some people deny that there's systemic racism. Maybe it is because they don't understand or know what it means. Systemic racism occurs when institutions and or social systems create racial inequality. And as a result of hidden and blatant institutional biases, policies, practices, and procedures that privilege some groups while disadvantaging others. It is created, maintained, and applied by narratives, individuals, groups, and systems. You see, in this project we call Canada, we too often come, do not come to terms with our long history of exclusion and domination, slavery and racism. Most Canadians do not know that African slavery existed in the colonies of New France and British North America for 200 years. We think always of the United States. We don't realize that we practice that in this country. In the founding of New France and eventually Canada, a great number of Canadian politicians and some Roman Catholic priests owned enslaved Africans. Too often we only focus on the narrative of the Underground Railway and the Canada's role in welcoming runaway enslaved people from the United States, but we have our own history to deal with. And as well, too often Canada's intentional amnesia also extends to the heinous way in which we've treated other peoples also. The Indian Act of 1876, the trauma of residential schools and the 60s scoop, the reality of that legislation still persisting today. The Chinese laborers who built the Canadian Railway, the Pacific Railway, incurring deaths, and then when they finished building it, being slapped upon with a head tax. The 1911 order in council by Prime Minister uh, Sir Wilfrid Laurier's cabinet, and it was specifically to, to ban black immigration to Canada. Then in 1939, Canada turned away the MS St. Louis carrying 907 Jewish refugees escaping the Nazi regime. They were forced back and 254 of them ended up in the gas chambers. Then during the Second World War, the Canadian government forced 20,000 Japanese people, 75% of them Canadian citizens into internment camps. And after the Second World War, Canada continued with a range of policies that made it difficult and at times impossible for non-white people to immigrate from Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. It wasn't until 1976 that a point system was introduced which allowed fairer immigration policies, but it is still not fully just. And still today, still today, exclusionary and racist policies exist. We have a long history of not welcoming and celebrating and honoring people. From every nation, every tribe, every people, every language standing before the throne of the Lamb. Our text concludes with doxology, with an act of worship. Salvation belongs to God. The Greek word for salvation is soteria, meaning rescue and safety. God is about rescuing and saving those who are underfoot. I believe, I believe that our worship life, our prayer life, our communal life, our life witnessing to the gospel, our life agitating for justice and peace, and our life of fierce loving, all have to be empowered and directed by God in order that there may be a bestowal of salvation, rescue and safety for all people. I believe that when we gather for faithful worship, though very much through virtual means these days, it's purpose to tell the truth. We gather not just to hang around and be with each other, but it is purpose to tell the truth, expose lies, confess sin and penetrate illusion. Faithful worship is, in the words of liturgical scholar Michael Warren, a zone of contestation where competing claims of truth duke it out. 
We have to privilege God's testimony. We have to privilege God's justice and God's welcome for the human flourishing of humanity. I believe that as Hebrew says, we are to provoke one another to love and good works. Let us consider how to provoke one another to love and justice. Provocation from God usurps us from our complacency and says we have to figure out a way to live in humanity and to flourish as a human community with justice and hope and power and prayer. May the Spirit of God, may the Spirit of God animate us to privilege the good news of God's faithful testimony in our struggle against racism and racial justice and human flourishing for all God's people. And may we join in doxology and praise in the words of that honored, great, diverse multitude. Salvation belongs to God. Rescue and safety for all. Looking at ourselves, being transformed by God's spirit, and thereby transforming the very world in which we find ourselves. The systems and the policies and the laws. So that justice will prevail and the glory of God be found. Amen. Amen. And amen. A prayer of hope. Gods are God. You have heard the cries of your people. You see the tears shed and you feel the pain in our hearts, in our souls and in our bodies. You know that we feel anger, frustration and real fear for so many reasons. And we know that you know. Holy Spirit, omnipresent comforter, be the balm that each one of us needs. Be the balm that our collective souls as black people need. And as you heal us, infuse us with your hope. Romans 5 verse 5 reminds us of your hope, which makes us not ashamed because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. That is the hope for which we pray. Hope which gives us strength to stand when we feel broken. Hope that enables us to stand with our sisters and brothers. Hope which assures us that others are standing with us. We are not alone. Hope that says a change is coming. A change in the attitudes and perceptions of our communities. A change in the structures and the systems of government. A change at all levels of this united church of ours. Give us your hope that does not disappoint. Your hope that allows the love you poured into our hearts to overcome our anger and our fears. Your hope that allows the love poured into our hearts to be passed on to our children and our children's children. Hope that your kingdom will come and that the earth will indeed be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. May it be so. In the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. We lift the light of this candle as we continue our commitment to work to end racism for the sakes of our youth and the children. So before we, uh, before I sing the last song, um, I just want to say thank you for everybody to, uh, for being here. My name is Adam Kilner and I'm playing the music. Uh, for tonight, and all of the music that you're hearing is is actually from this unreleased album that's called Freedom Tapestry. I hope you can see that. Uh, this is the painting for it that was that was just done. So the first song was called "Have Mercy on Us All." This one's called "We Cannot Keep from Singing," and uh, I, I hope it speaks to you. wide the gates of love the sea of change will always have you swimming the shoes of peace will carry on our souls that thirst for you will find all hatred swimming from our bones when all rope is gone 
and the tears that carried on. You always sold me, and we cannot keep from singing, and we cannot keep from singing. You're always moving on. You always hold me. Traveling the road Life and death Are always juxtaposed The cross, the vein of love The vine and all its branches We obliterate the pain And find our second chances In your love When all hope is gone Lift your joyful song And the tears have carried on You always sold me, yeah You always sold me And we cannot keep from singing And we Yes, indeed, we cannot keep from singing. Words from my brother from India, working and serving with the Global Ministries in the United Church in, in, in the USA, Adina Bandu Manchala. At a time when religious institutions, resources, symbols and identities are abused, and misused to hurt, kill, and legitimize injustice and exploitation. 
it is necessary to set aside these sources of privilege and be more like Jesus. Jesus who defied similar powers of his time in obedience to God. It is time that in the same spirit of obedience, the church unmasked and exposed the shallowness of power and privilege. Cultures and structures of discrimination are motivated exclusively by the desire to dominate and subjugate in order to grab and accrue wealth, power, and privileges. There is nothing glorious about such power that parades itself in the face of powerlessness. The struggles are profoundly moral and spiritual struggles. The point is that those on the margins have a view of the world. It's muck and malaise that those at the center do not. Our experiences of suffering and struggles for justice are the resources that could make us introspect and embark on this collective transformation. Let us allow ourselves to be transformed into a new people, a new generation with justice, compassion, and interdependence as our guiding values so that all of us are able to breathe to breathe freedom, to breathe peace, and to breathe life. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, who loves and delights in all people, we stand in awe before you, knowing that the spark of life within each person on earth is the spark of your divine life. Differences among cultures and races are multicolored manifestations of your light. We pray against forces of injustice. We denounce the demons of prejudice. O oh Lord our God, in your mercy and kindness, no thought of ours is left unnoticed, no desire or concern ignored. Surrounded by violence and cries for justice, we hear your voice telling us what is required, only to do justice and to love goodness and to walk humbly with your people. Fill us with your mercy so that we in turn may be merciful to others. Strip away pride, suspicion, and racism so that we may seek peace and justice in our communities. Flood our path with your light as we walk humbly towards a future filled with encounter and unity. Be with us, Holy One, in our efforts for only by the prompting of your grace can we progress towards love. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We light this candle to represent our hope for a new day. We sing a song full of faith that the dark past has taught us. We sing a song full of hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising of the sun, our new day began. We march till victory is won. May the God of our weary years, the God of our silent tears, Bless us with a restless discomfort about easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships. 
so that we may seek truth boldly and love deeply within our hearts. May the God of our weary years, the God of our silent tears, bless us with a holy anger at injustice, racism, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we may tirelessly work for justice, freedom, and peace among all people. May the God of our weary years, the God of our silent tears, bless us with the gift of tears to shed for those who suffer the pain, rejection, humiliation, or the loss of all that they cherish, so that you may work for justice to transform the world. Amen. May the God of our weary years, the God of our silent tears, bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we really can make a difference in this world so that we are able with God's grace to do what others claim cannot be done. Amen. We go to love and serve. Amen. <laughs>